Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Encouraging Conservation, an in-depth look at non-pricing approaches. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center, and I know that uh, everyone is interested in receiving certificates of completion. Uh, if you are interested in receiving a certificate, you can. Uh, this webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing edu education credits, so you will need to self-submit in order to receive any available continuing education credits. The EFCN recommends that you check with your licensing agency to learn about its criteria, rules, and what you need to do in order to receive credit for your attendance. It is your responsibility to verify this information. We will email you your certificate of attendance within 30 days of the webinar date and you can utilize this document to self-submit for continuing education credits. This session is one of many webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project. The EFCM provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. All right, here you can take a look at our team our network really extends across the U.S. We have centers in most regions, so take a look to see if there's someone close to you. And here you can see the areas of expertise that we focus on. We provide workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance on a variety of topics, including those listed here. That includes asset management, rate setting, water loss reduction, resiliency planning, and many others. We also have a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through these blog posts. We also feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, descriptions of available tools, and small system success stories. Uh, we will give you the opportunity to subscribe to this blog at the end of the webinar if you'd like. And one last uh, resource I'd really like to point out to you before we get started is our online funding sources uh, map. Uh, this tool can help you find major sources of funding for infrastructure projects for each state and territory. And here's how you would access those tables. On the EFCN homepage, go to the Resources tab and click on Funding Sources by State, as you can see in the slide. This will take you to a map of the country. If you click on the state that you're interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for that state. The table looks like the image on the left of the slide. For each funding program, it includes the name of the program, a short description, and the contact information for someone you can reach out to. Before I turn the presentation over to our experts today, I just have two quick polling questions just to get us started. I'm gonna launch those now. The first question is, what kind of water utility do you represent? And these polls uh, just let us get a sense of who's joining us today virtually, since we can't all be together in the same room. So it looks like we have about 53% voting, so I'm gonna close this poll in just a few more seconds. All right, in three, two, one, I'm closing this poll. And great, so it looks like uh, of our uh, systems that are, that are water systems today, the majority are local government or municipal or county owned systems. We also have a fair amount of not-for-profit systems, and we definitely have a population of us today that are not water systems as well. All right, and one more poll just to get the ball rolling. What size water or sewer system does your utility operate? Just do your best to estimate which group you fit into here. We're looking to see if you're a small system or maybe a larger system. Great, so it looks like almost everyone's voted. So I'm gonna close this poll in just another few seconds. Three, two, one. Great, so it looks like we have a good amount of large systems with us today of those of us that are water systems, about 23%, and also a decent even distribution of small, very small and medium systems. Awesome. So I'm going to just show you our disclaimer quickly, and I'd also like to, at this time, uh, introduce our presenter, Glenn Barnes, who will be discussing non-pricing approaches, approaches for conservation. Glenn is the Associate Director at the University of North Carolina Environmental Finance Center, and he's going to be taking it away. 
Thanks, Glenn. All right, thank you, Tess. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for joining uh, today. So I really appreciate you um, listening in on our discussion about encouraging conservation and looking specifically at non-pricing approaches to encouraging conservation. So uh, we're going to have the, the hour to talk about these different methods, and then we'll certainly have some time to take your questions and to hear maybe a little bit about some of the programs that you're doing at your utility. And so, uh, again, thank you for joining us. So uh, uh, back in May, we did a webinar about encouraging customers to conserve, where we did an overview of both pricing and non-pricing approaches. Uh, so this webinar, like all of our webinars, is available on our project page and on our YouTube site. So you'll get a link to it uh, when we send out the slide deck. And if you haven't seen that already, that's a good overview of all of the different ways that we see water systems uh, encouraging conservation. But we're going to really dig in today very specifically on the non-pricing strategies. And what we'll do probably in a couple months, I'm not sure if we've set the date exactly, but we'll do a deeper dive into those pricing signals again, because I think both approaches uh, have their merits. And what we'll do is as, as we go through the day-to-day, -day, we're going to talk a little bit about these non-pricing strategies that work really well, but then also the potential impact that has on revenue which will nicely set up the further discussion we'll have on the pricing strategies a little bit later this year. So why do water systems want to promote conservation? I, I think this is a question we, we spent a lot of time answering on previous webinars, but obviously uh, it can be a cost savings for water systems that they don't have to produce as much water. Uh, they may be near the end of their storage capacity. They may have be facing drought. Uh, they may have a growing population. Their infrastructure might be kind of at the at the edge of uh, their infrastructure's capabilities. They don't have a lot of water supply. So there's a lot of reasons why a water system would want to promote conservation. But I think it's important as we do this deeper dive into the non-pricing approaches to understand that there's going to be differences here in kind of the why and, and how to go about doing this based on whether or not the water system is metering per gallon or per unit water use. And so I want to actually start with the population of water systems that do not meter for water use. So who are these water systems? These are going to be some community water systems that have a flat rate. So for example, that would be, you know, $10 a month or $25 a month for unlimited water use or they don't charge a rate directly. Perhaps it's included in the rent for a mobile home park or an apartment, or it's built into uh, condo or HOA fees. So there are a group of community water systems that do not meter for water, do not charge based on the volume of, of water consumed. And then virtually all non-community water systems do not charge per unit of water consumed, whether that be a shopping mall or an office building or a hospital or a hotel, restaurant, a business, marina, uh, any type of entity that is a non-community water system, so serving water to people primarily where they work, not where they live, that uh, they are not charging a per unit amount. So a school is not requiring you to put a quarter in the toilet every time you need to flush it. Um, a restaurant is not, you know, doing the same in its bathroom. Hospitals are not including a water bill for patients. It's just built into the overall cost structure. So these are, you know, probably the vast majority of the federally regulated water systems in the United States are not metering for water. And if you do not charge per unit of water consumed, at the very least, you have a financial incentive for your water users to conserve because every unit that you don't have to produce is going to save you chemicals, it's going to save you power, it's going to save you time, their opportunity costs if the person who's responsible for making water has other responsibilities. So generally speaking, you at least have a financial incentive. Now, you also may be facing drought, you also may have supply issues, storage issues, et cetera. But what's really important to remember, if you do not have a volumetric charge, a per unit charge, is your water users have no incentive to conserve. They have no incentive. So they have no incentive to replace 
uh, old fixtures, they have no incentive to fix a leaking toilet or if you're a landlord to tell you about a leaking toilet. Um, my uh, suite mate, when I was an undergraduate, liked to take 45 minute showers. When we lived in the dorm, we didn't get a water bill. Uh, so he was able to do that without any problem. You know, that was a, a cost that was then given to the university to have to pay, but it didn't directly come to him as a user. And so your users do not have any kind of financial incentive to conserve. So there are a couple of things that you can do if this is your type of water system. And by the way, if you do charge, all of these are going to be relevant for you as well. So um, keep your attention on it if, if you are a metering water system. But a couple of things I want to talk about are water efficient devices and fixing leaks, asking water users to use less water and trying to incentivize them to use less water. So let's start with water efficient devices and, and fixing leaks. I think it's important to understand how we use water within say a residential area or within a commercial area. And so there was some really interesting uh, studies done by Penn State Extension Program recently that was looking at different fixtures, how often they're used and what kind of water consumption they have. So toilets. Uh, toilets used to be the largest water users in most homes. Pre-1950 toilets, which I still see around from time to time, used seven gallons per flush. Um, starting around 1950 through 1980, they used about five gallons of flush. Then they became a little more efficient. They were three and a half gallons per flush, which you still see a, a large number. And since 1994, you now have uh, the sort of lower flow devices using about 1.6 gallons per flush. So if you know that uh, your customers have a lot of these pre-1950 or pre-1980 toilets, incentivizing or toilet replacement or doing toilet replacement if you're a landlord could be a really good way to, to save on the gallons. Faucets. Oh, and I should mention too, um, with the toilets, Penn State estimated that a typical household flushes about five times a day. For faucets, which we use on average about eight minutes per day, um, again, a pre-1994 faucet would have been about three gallons per minute. Since 1994, it's two and a half, but a low flow would only be one and a half. So again, if you have a lot of pre-1994s, you replace them with low flow, you're going to cut that water use in half, uh, assuming that people then don't run the faucet more, more than they did before. Shower heads, um, probably used about uh, five minutes per day on average. Uh, pre-1980 ones used 4.3 gallons per minute. Uh, the low flow ones now use two gallons per minute or less. So again, significant place for savings. In, in my house, we had one of those pre-1980 shower heads, replaced it with a super low flow using about a gallon and a half per minute. And that probably cut our household consumption by almost a thousand gallons a month. So really potentially big savings if you have those older types of shower heads. Washing machines, uh, another big water user within a household, um, seven loads per week, especially for those that, that have a big family, lots of kids, et cetera. Um, Pre-1980 washing machines use about 56 gallons per load. Um, compare that to a standard uh, top loading model today, which would be about 43, or a front loader that would be 27. So again, pretty significant area of replacement here on washing machines. And then finally, dishwashers, also used about five times a week on average by families. Um, those 1980 uh, to 1990 ones were using as much as 14 gallons per load, and the current ones are eight at the high end, and the water efficient ones are about four and a half per load on the low end. So lots and lots of opportunities here. If you're not charging people for water use to try to uh, replace some of these water fixtures, especially if they're pre-1980, uh, ones, and you could see a significant amount of water reduction as a result of that. Now, on the uh, kind of non-residential side, this was a study I believe that AWWA did. It looked at different types of entities and how much water they use and where they use it. So for school buildings, restrooms, uh, probably not surprisingly, are the big water users, accounting for almost 50% of the water use within a school. So toilets would be a great place to target if you uh, have a school within your system. 
And then landscaping, uh, outdoor irrigation was 28%. So even though you might think watering sporting fields and things like that would use a tremendous amount of water, it's still not nearly as much as the restroom usage within most schools. For hotels, uh, kind of a similar uh, look here that again, the restrooms, and this includes all of the, the guest rooms are about 30% of use. Uh, again, those uh, rest, uh, hotel guests are not paying directly for the water bill, so they don't have a lot of incentive to conserve. And then things like landscaping and laundry and the kitchen are also pretty significant users. So again, think about those low flow devices that we just mentioned. And then for restaurants, uh, the kitchen is responsible for about 50% of the water use, and there's certainly a lot of uh, low flow water devices with spray nozzles, faucets, dishwashers, et cetera, for commercial kitchens. But don't forget about the restrooms here either, which are still about a third of the gallons used in a typical restaurant is coming from the bathrooms. So that is another significant place where you could see some water savings. So these are some of the places where if you have leaks that, you know, translate kind of those per gallon usage to leaks. Um, we know toilets leaking can use an enormous amount of water, far more than most people realize. Uh, if you have uh, properties where, again, you're a water system and you're not metering for that water, these might be ways that you want to uh, encourage conservation. But another option that we have is actually to ask water users to use less water. And so this is something you often see in hotels. So there's an option to kind of um, almost opt into the conservation. So you put a towel on the rack it means you'll use it again, or if you put the towel on the floor, it means replace it. So this is a, a strategy many hotels have used to try to save water. And then uh, we even see some approaches where it's almost an opt out of conservation. So this was uh, the California Hotel and Lodging Association that put together this little card for members to use. And if you read the first sentence there, as part of our effort to conserving water, we will not be changing your linens every day. If you want them changed, place this card on the bed. So with the towel one, you know, I guess it's, you know, you're still kind of opting in a little bit because you'd have to hang the towel up versus putting it on the floor. But for the, uh, for the linen one, it's specifically saying, we're not going to do this unless you tell us otherwise. So again, these are uh, just ways to ask water users to use less water. And public conservation notices can be helpful as well. So anytime you have a public facility that uh, has water use there, you can encourage people to conserve. And I was out a couple months ago in Santa Fe, New Mexico, doing a workshop, saw a conservation sign in the bathroom and was curious because it said by statute. So I found the statute. Uh, we'll put a link to it in the materials we send out to you. So a public facility is uh, required to include a sign, and here's an example of what the sign looks like, uh, reminding users that Santa Fe is in a high desert, and regardless of weather conditions, water is always scarce. So, I think, you know, this is just another way of kind of customer information. And then the uh, West Basin uh, water system, as part of one of their programs we'll talk about a little bit later, actually has these uh, PDF documents that you can print out and put up in commercial kitchens that have strategies of ways you can conserve water. So again, there's no requirement here, but this is just a way of a water system giving resources to uh, commercial kitchens so that way their users have some idea of how to uh, cut back on water use. And then finally, maybe one twist on this idea from a hotel I stayed in recently was instead of just asking you to conserve, please conserve, you know, leave the card on the bed if you want the linens changed or hang your towel up if you'll reuse it. Um, what this program actually says is for each night that you forego full housekeeping, so I imagine that would be uh, linens, towels, et cetera, you actually get a $5 uh, voucher, I assume, to spend on food or beverage from participating venues, or you get points on your frequent guest account. So this was actually um, looking to provide some type of incentive. It's not, I mean, it's, it's kind of a financial incentive. It's not cash in hand, but it's some type of incentive for people to conserve beyond just asking them, which I thought was an interesting approach to share. So as I said, that 
kind of encapsulates broadly the universe of water systems that do not charge their customers directly for water use. There's not a, a metered water. But if you do meter for water, all of those strategies that we talked about, fixing leaks um, on, on kind of a user level and thinking about it, the efficiency of devices and thinking about, um, you know, politely asking or finding some ways to incentivize people to voluntarily conserve, all of those are still very relevant for you. And those are good strategies to look at. But there's a few more things uh, that you might be able to do, again, because you're, you've got a volumetric charge and because uh, you may want to dive a little bit deeper into some of these. So uh, in addition to these strategies that we've talked about, I want to talk about some ways of conserving water at the system level and then promoting conservation at the water customer level as well. So I think at the system level, just really broadly, what we're talking about here is fixing real water loss. So I hope all of you are familiar with the idea of doing a water balance or water audit. Uh, what I have on the screen is the output from the AWWA tool that I think many of you are familiar with. We've done several webinars on this that, that you can find and have a lot of good resources. But essentially, you're going to figure out as you do your water balance and you need uh, meter data really to be able to do this well, uh, is what is authorized consumption and what is not. And of the uh, water loss, you need to further narrow it down to your apparent losses, which could be um, people steering water or customer metering errors or data errors, which is still an important thing to fix. But from the purpose of non-pricing conservation strategy, we really want to focus on that bottom area, the real losses, which are leaks on your service lines, on your mains, and tank overflows or tank leaks. So this is where water is literally exiting your system and not reaching any customer at all, whereas the apparent losses, it is reaching a customer. It's just not being billed correctly. So from a conservation standpoint, um, and really just from a general water management standpoint, we always encourage systems to do these water loss audits. And again, if that's something you're interested in doing, um, when we ask a little bit later in the hour about technical assistance, please indicate yes if you're a small system and we can get up with you and, and help you with this. But beyond that strategy of trying to find where water is, is physically leaking out of your system, from a conservation standpoint, uh, what we're going to look at are some of the things that you can do to um, affect your water users who are paying that bill and who are getting metered for their water use. And the first thing that we'll look at is increasing the amount of customer information through the water bill. So however often you send a bill, whether it's monthly, bimonthly, quarterly, uh, that is probably the primary way that you are uh, communicating with your water customers. And you have an opportunity through that actual physical bill to provide some information that will help customers think about their water use. And one strategy that we have here is just to bill monthly. So that way customers are getting that information on, on a more regular basis. Uh, but there's a couple other things that you could do on the water bill itself. So this is uh, the Orange Water and Sewer Authority, or OWASA, is uh, not a small water system. They're a large water system, and they serve the university where I'm at here in Chapel Hill. And here's a copy of uh, one of their actual bills. This is one of my uh, coworkers who has them as a utility. And what you'll notice here, first off, is that they have the rate structure printed right on the bill. So they have what the water service charges, and then uh, they have an increasing block rate structure. And in this particular month, um, this particular user was only in the first block. So you see that on right on the bill and what the charge is. And if um, this had been a larger consumption month and they had gone into higher blocks, you would have seen that as well. So the rate structure is printed right there on the bill, which is really, really helpful for customers to be reminded of how you're charging them for water make them think about uh, potentially cutting back, especially if you have increasing block rates. And then they also include this table of historic usage. So you can see your usage over time, um, usually going back at least one year and trying to get a sense of like, oh, okay, you know, do I have peaks and valleys? Am I disproportionately high this particular month? As you can see with this particular customer, uh, she's fairly consistent month in and month out in terms of her water use. 
But again, that's a way to let customers know, am I in the ballpark of my historic use? But you can go even a step beyond that. So this is the Coachella Valley Water District in California, uh, also a large system. And so they do two things that are of interest here. One is that they show uh, your consumption level compared to um, what they would consider to be tiers of customers. So, you know, low water users, kind of medium water users, high water users. And this graph here is actually showing um, not just an, an estimation, but actual customer data from the utilities. So they're plotting your usage over time and then your usage compared to your neighbors within the water system. And then at the very bottom where you see the giant word that says efficient, um, they are actually giving you a rating of your water use. And I have seen copies of their bills that are not this low and the usage is much higher and it will uh, even say something like wasteful on there. So trying to give people just a really um, specific clue as to how they compare to other water users. Um, so with that, we want to ask a quick poll question of the water systems in attendance uh, to see if you are doing any of these practices. So Tess, can you go ahead and launch that first poll for us? Yep, absolutely. So our uh, poll question is, do you use any of the following billing practices? And then just check them all, check every single one that applies. And your options are monthly billing, historic usage information on bills, rate structure information on bills, and lastly, comparison of usage to local averages. So we'll give you just a couple more seconds to get your response in, and then we'll share the results with you. Okay, it looks like we're getting a little bit closer to having full participation here. I'm gonna give you three seconds, two, and one. And great. So here you can sort of see that most people uh, checked, 68% of folks checked monthly billing. That was the highest, uh, that was the major billing practice that folks were using. The least popular seems to be comparison of usage to local averages. And then we have sort of um, a good number of people, 40% and 30% respectively, using historical usage and rate structure information. Okay, thanks everybody for that. And if um, you responded yes to uh, any of those questions, you might be hearing from me to get a little more detail so we can uh, expand a little bit our, our universe of examples. Okay, um, another kind of broad strategy, help customers reduce usage, whether this is indoor or outdoor, residential or commercial, there's a lot of strategies here. And what I wanna do really throughout this webinar is to go through some examples of existing programs. Most of them are from small water systems. And I think you'll notice that quite a number of them, perhaps not surprisingly, are from the state of California, where we know the state went through uh, really historic drought conditions over the past several years and it resulted in some mandates from the state level for conservation. So, you know, we've gone through and, and looked at some examples of programs and wanted to just share with you, uh, a, you know, a glimpse of how some of your colleagues at other water systems and, and largely small water systems are handling these particular questions. So I will also say that a really terrific tool if you're looking for examples of rebates is on the EPA WaterSense uh, website. They have a rebate finder where you can filter by state or province, by the type of rebate offered, et cetera. And uh, they have links to websites. And we found a good number of these examples due to this EPA page. So really terrific page. And if your water system is doing some of this and you're not on the page, I'm sure there's a way, uh, there's a contact us uh, link right on the page that you could use to reach out to them and uh, provide some additional information. All right, so um, Mammoth County Water District is uh, one example that we wanted to pull up that does rebates on low flow fixtures. So they have a toilet rebate program. Um, so these need to be water sense labeled toilets using 1.28 gallons per flush or have a high low flush uh, option. And the rebates are up to $200 per toilet for the first two toilets in a unit and then up to 100 for additional toilets. And then they also do a high efficiency clothes washer rebate. So um, these, again, have a water factor of 4.5 or less, and the rebate is up to $400. So this is something we see a lot on the energy side, 
A lot of energy utilities offer these kinds of rebates for energy efficient appliances, uh, but here's an example of a water system that is doing it. Um, Blue Lake Springs uh, Municipal Water Company in California does a toilet rebate program as well. Um, so it's $50 per toilet with a limit of two um, per household, and there are some terms and conditions. And I should mention on all of these slides, you'll notice that the title of the water system, the headline of the slide is a hyperlink. And so when we send the slide deck out, the PDF out, you'll be able to click on that and it will take you directly to the page describing these programs if you want some additional information. All right, West Basin Municipal Water District in California uh, does a commercial kitchen program called Cash for Kitchens. So again, we're seeing that uh, kitchen being a huge use in typical uh, restaurants in terms of water. And so what they do is, um, this is for any type of corporate kitchen, hotels, schools, et cetera. So they do assessments of water use to try to help uh, these commercial kitchens cut back on water. And so that provides some uh, tips of what to do, some free materials, uh, for training, and they also have some free water saving devices such as pre rinse spray valves, faucet aerators, et cetera. So, what they're really providing here is a good service to customers that type of evaluation, again, sort of based on the idea of an energy audit that a lot of energy utilities do, and then some uh, low cost, low flow uh, incentives as well. All right, so that's kind of a, a little bit on the inside. Let's take a look at some examples on the outside. So this is Santa Clara Valley Water District, and uh, they have landscape conservation rebates. They have a number of programs. So one is uh, essentially like a, a turf buyback program or a grass buyback program. So you can see they have a cost per square foot of uh, grass, and it depends a little bit on uh, the type of unit that you are and where you are within the uh, the larger water districts. So they have a, a number of different incentive programs to get people to basically take grass out and replace it with something that does not use water. Um, they also have an inline drip irrigation rebate and then a number of just dollar rebates on irrigation hardware. And you can see some of the things here include high efficiency nozzles, rotor sprinklers, rain sensors, uh, and, and many other types of things. So depending on the type of incentive that you do, they have a different cash level that they will pay. City of Big Bear Lake, California also does a turf buyback program. So the idea here is that grass uh, uses a tremendous amount of water. So if you replace it with something that uh, does not require any watering that they want to incentivize that. And so, uh, you know, we see some examples here of, um, you know, they're paying 50 cents per square foot of turf removed. There's no minimum amount, but if you read at the bottom here, however, if you later decide to replant any of the turf, you're going to have to reimburse those, uh, those rebates. And then the city of Kennedale, Texas does a residential sprinkler system evaluation program. So again, this is um, not a, um, you know, not providing you with a free product or a incentive, financial incentive for a product, but they're gonna come out and actually have an expert look at your sprinkler system and optimize it so that way it's using the smallest amount of water possible to achieve its watering goals. So another way that you can use to, uh, to incentivize your customers to use less water is by helping them optimize some of their outdoor irrigation. Okay, so those are some kind of uh, programs of looking at efficiency of water use. And then we also see just straight up restrictions on usage. That could be all the time, it could be seasonally, it could be in times of drought. And this is something I think a lot of water systems do. We just have a couple of examples to share. So the town of Millick in Colorado, uh, they have a watering schedule, as you see here, where it restricts the time of day. So it's either gonna be from midnight to 9 a.m. or 7 p.m. to midnight. So it's going to avoid uh, essentially 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. because if you're watering uh, during the night or in these off times, there's probably less evaporation going on. And then they also restrict the days of the week. So for home addresses ending in an even number, 
They can water on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Home address is ending in an odd number, can water on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then uh, nobody can water on Sunday. Now, strictly speaking, this kind of approach, especially restricting the days of the week, does not absolutely guarantee that you're going to receive uh, water conservation because somebody, you know, may not have been watering on a daily basis, so watering every other day. They may only water once or twice a week, and they're still only going to water once or twice a week. But there are probably some homes that are constantly irrigating and probably unnecessarily so. And so this is an approach that we see a lot of water systems taking. And then uh, Victoria, Minnesota, um, they do a seasonal approach. So the odd, even, and time of day watering restrictions are only effective from May 1st through September 30th. And then again, they're restricting the days of the week, um, just like the previous example from Milliken, and then also the time of day. And in their case, they do not allow irrigation between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Blue Lake Springs um, that we looked at a little bit earlier the, uh, in California, they have watering restrictions based on the drought level that is going on. So if it's stage one of drought, uh, as you can see here, everything is voluntary. So they're asking people voluntarily not to water forest trees and then to do odd even outside watering um, over six days a week and then no watering on Monday and again no watering between 10 and 6. But this is voluntary. When they go to drought stage two, um, these become mandatory restrictions. So uh, you're not allowed to do these types of waterings uh, that we talked about as being voluntary under stage one. And then they've added at the bottom of the bullet, no unnecessary watering, things like decks, driveways, or cars, et cetera. So that becomes mandated under drought stage two. And then under drought stage three, um, as you can see in all caps at the bottom, absolutely no outside watering. So these are mandatory restrictions, uh, severe prohibitions, as they put it in, in the parenthetical on the use. So again, this is a, a place that has water use restrictions, but it is based on the availability of water supply, and they're using the drought level as a way of measuring that. And then finally, um, the Forney Lake Water Supply Company in Texas has a uh, really good drought contingency plan uh, up on their website that we read through. And they have a stage one, again, which is voluntary. So um, they're going to do some uh, water use reductions at the water at the corporation level, so reducing flushing of water mains, for example, and then they have voluntary water restrictions, uh, day of the week watering based on your last name. And so again, this is just voluntarily asking customers, they have stage two, and then you can see here the stage three, which is a severe water shortage condition. Um, there are all kinds of water use restrictions in place, um, you know, not allowing you to wash vehicles during certain times of day, to not water landscape during certain times of day. Um, you know, restaurants are prohibited from serving water except when requested, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, you know, a number of restrictions that go into place. And they even have a stage four where it's a water emergency that basically just says don't use any water. But again, these last two examples are interesting because they're scaling their water use restrictions based on the availability of water supply. All right, so we have a couple more polling questions for you about your use. Um, and Tess, go ahead and please launch those for us. Awesome. Yeah, so the first uh, poll has been launched, so go ahead and put your responses in. Do you have any programs to reduce indoor water use? Please select all that apply. And your options are rebates on low flow devices, free low flow devices, uh, programs to help fix leaks, or programs specifically targeting commercial water use. Great, so looks like we're getting some responses in. I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple more seconds to respond here. And in three, two, one, I'm going to close this poll. Great. So it looks like 68% use uh, programs to help fix leaks. We also have some uh, some respondents that use rebates on low flow devices, 14%. 9% uh, free low flow devices and 9% programs specifically targeting indoor water use. Okay, 
right, and then we have one more in the same vein. I'm launching that one now. And do you have any programs to reduce outdoor water use? And you can select those that apply. So time of day watering restrictions is an option here. Days of the week water restrictions, landscape or lawn replacement programs, sprinkler evaluations or repair programs. Go ahead and uh, do your best to get those responses in. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and then we'll share the results. Okay, and I think we'll do three more seconds. Three, two, one. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. All right, and again, it looks like there's a lot of people using time of day watering restrictions, and another, so 47%, and then another 47% using days of the week water restrictions. Um, landscape or lawn replacement programs. That's a minority, 0%, and then also some folks in the minority, sprinkler and evaluation repair programs. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give it back to you, Glenn. All right. Thank you. Um, and thanks for those responses. Like, again, it's, it's interesting for us to see what, uh, what is out there. And then uh, the final strategy that I want to talk about here are alternative sources for outdoor irrigation. So... Um, it, it's always interesting, I think, for, for me, uh, you know, I come from a public administration background, um, was in the environmental nonprofit world, so I kind of came to water a little bit later in my career and from a finance perspective and not an engineering perspective. But it does um, surprise me uh, in some ways that, you know, we use potable water to, uh, to water lawns and to do outdoor irrigation and you know kind of take the time to, to treat that water. But obviously a lot of it just has to do with distribution and availability. And then also just, you know, kids who like to drink out of, out of hoses and things like that. So, um, you know, we're, we're always interested in looking at though, are there ways that outdoor irrigation could use alternative sources to be able to, um, to offset some of the potable water supply? So one program that we found, um, we know there's a number of water systems that do this, but this is a, a small system, I believe, Todd Creek Village in Colorado, that um, they have a dual pipe system. So they have a purified drinking water for inside the home and then having non-potable water for outdoor irrigation. And so it's a completely separate infrastructure and supply system, and they have different uh, pipelines, pump stations, and water sources, as the website here says. So this is an, a, something that we see in a lot of places. And I mentioned OWASA, the utility that serves the University of North Carolina, where I work. We uh, at the university actually helped pay for a separate irrigation line to go in several years ago from OWASA because we use such a tremendous amount of water for outdoor irrigation being a large university campus. And we worked with OWASA to have this non-potable line come in for outdoor irrigation use. And again, this is strictly speaking, not saving a gallon of water, but it may be saving a gallon of potable water and it certainly could be saving some cost. Um, and the water that we see here could just be raw water. It could be uh, discharged water from the water treatment process and then also treated wastewater we have seen as uh, some examples of these irrigation type systems that are using non-potable water. And then um, maybe on a much smaller scale uh, are rain barrels. So a rain barrel is a device that is used to collect rainwater. And uh, that rainwater could be used right at the, uh, at the household level for irrigating gardens or things like that. Now, this is a place where we really encourage you to check your local ordinances if you're interested in this type of program because we know that in uh, some drier parts of the country or areas where water rights are a thing, sometimes rain barrels are not allowed and you do hear um, you know, stories that again, I think for people not in the water business amaze them that, oh, somebody got fined for collecting the rain. Like how could they do that? Well, it's because of this idea of water rights and everything. But if uh, rain barrels are allowed, we do see towns and water systems that do programs to try to reduce the cost. And so this is one from Rutland, uh, Massachusetts. And so um, they offer barrels for $69. They have a, a uh, 
corporate partner that helps allow them to do this. And apparently it's a program run in a number of communities in the state. And uh, they have very specific pickup dates. So it's just two days that they're available. Um, and you need to let them know ahead of time that you're planning to purchase one. And so, um, you know, this is an interesting program, again, to help customers purchase a reduced cost rain barrel to use for outdoor irrigation. So that way, again, they're cutting back on that potable water usage. And then Groveport, Ohio does a similar program. Um, so they have gotten a grant from the Ohio EPA um, or did in 2013 to be able to do these types of rain barrels and they also did municipal rain gardens. So um, if any of you are also responsible for stormwater, uh, you know, this is kind of looking at a decentralized BMP approach to stormwater control, but also doing rain barrels as a way to cut down on those irrigation costs. And so uh, they're able to offer a rain barrel for uh, the bargain basement price of $30 under the grant. And there is a limit of one per household and available to residents only. And so you can take a look at some of the details on their program as well. All right, so we have uh, one more, one final polling question on kind of your uh, behavior at your utility, which you can probably guess what's coming. So Tess, go ahead and launch that for us. Awesome, yeah, so I've launched the poll. Uh, the question is, do you have any programs that use alternative water sources for irrigation? And then we've just given you our, the two topics we've been discussing, non-potable water for irrigation and rain barrels. Uh, so I'm gonna give you, Couple more seconds to respond here, and then we will share with the class, as they say. Uh, looks like we're getting a couple more votes still coming in. I'm gonna stop this in about three, two, and one. Great. So it looks like we have 36% of uh, folks joining us today reporting that they do use non-potable water for irrigation and another 29% saying they also use rain barrels. So about a third of each in each case. Great, Glenn, I'll give it back to you now. All right, and then the, the last thing that we just wanna mention, you know, if you're putting in these types of uh, restriction programs, you're putting in any of these types of programs, there's one last thing you need to do and that's enforce the mandate. So they're only going to be effective um, if they are enforced. And a couple of examples that we saw here, this is the Trophy Club Municipal Utility District in Texas. So um, they have right up on their website as part of their drought contingency plan, uh, what the fines are for essentially violating that plan. So it goes from a written warning to a uh, $50 uh, administrative penalty for a second violation to uh, the possibility of disconnection of service uh, for not following those rules. So, you know, they're very clear about what those restrictions are and if they are enforced, that again is a way to kind of encourage conservation and then um, Blue Lake Springs that we've looked at a couple of times today in that same drought action plan that we talked about before that had stage one, stage two, stage three, um, they have um, fines for wasting water, as you can see here, but when you are in drought stage three, those fines are doubled. So they have uh, tied the enforcement level to the drought level. So again, as the drought stage goes up at Blue Lake Springs, the uh, amount of restrictions goes up and actually the fines go up as well. So the last note that I wanna kind of leave you on, which will set us up for the webinar we'll do a little bit later this year, is we're in the business of selling water, especially for those of you who meter for water use. And if we want customers to use less water, what impact does that have on our revenue? If we're in the business of selling water, what does it mean? And if you are in that first group of utilities that we talked about, first group of water systems that do not meter for water, do not have a per unit charge, um, the answer is it has absolutely no impact on your revenue. It certainly will have an impact on your cost to encourage conservation, but it has no impact on your revenue. If you are um, a system that does meter for water, however, if your customers use less, you will get paid less. And if they use significantly less, you could get paid significantly less. And the big problem that we talked about a little bit in the overview webinar back in May, and we'll dive into a little bit more in our, in our third webinar in this series a little bit later this year, 
is that the cost of running a water system, the majority of costs, things like capital costs, salaries, et cetera, don't change based on how much water you treat and sell. Uh, the only costs that really do change would be chemicals, uh, the cost of electricity to move water around. Uh, if you buy water from another system, the cost of your bulk purchases of waters may change if your customers use less, but a lot of the costs end up being fixed. And so if your rate structure uh, most likely is putting a good amount of that revenue on the volumetric charge and not on the base charge, if customers come back, you may find yourself in the awkward position of not actually having enough money to cover your costs that do not change based on water use. And uh, this is an actual political cartoon for North Carolina when we had a drought probably about 10 or 15 years ago. You know, you've, you've got the robber baron utility shaking every last cent out of the poor sap's pocket saying, when you conserve water, we have a deficit, so I have to raise your rates. And people who don't really work in water think like, this is outrageous, how could this happen? But I think for those of us that work in the, in the field, we know that there is this difference between fixed and variable costs and that our revenue does often does not match that, often because of things like affordability concerns, that if we had a really high base charge and a low volume metric charge, water wouldn't be very affordable, especially for low using customers or fixed income customers. So all of the measures that I've talked about in this webinar work really well at conserving water. I think all of them, we have seen examples of these programs being successful all across the country, but the big concern is, what is that gonna do to the bottom line? And we can help you take a look at some uh, financial modeling to see how at risk you would be if customers cut back on usage in terms of your revenue and how much you wanna push conservation through these non-pricing approaches versus doing it through a pricing approach where uh, by raising the cost of water, you'd be disincentivizing usage and therefore driving down the cost of water to some extent, but helping to protect your revenue. So as I said, that is uh, another conversation for another day and we hope you'll come back in a couple months when we do that webinar. Uh, but with that, we've got about six minutes to take your questions and I think Tess has a couple of, of kind of closing out poll questions as well. So Tess, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thanks Glenn. Yeah, the first thing I'm gonna do for everyone is just to uh, send you, we do have an evaluation form that we use for these webinars that really helps us. So I'm going to send that out, and if you're so inclined to fill that out for us, that would be great. And then we do have some closing polls. So uh, I'm going to do those polls, and while you're doing them, if you could think about what you have to, if you have any questions, we will uh, get to those questions. That's probably more important, but if you need a few minutes to think of one, um, now's your opportunity. You can also decide if you'd like to just subscribe to our blog. Um, like I said in the beginning, the blog has a lot of success stories. It has a lot of lessons learned, lessons learned from our from our workshops and from our webinars. So you can you can put in here if you'd like that. Looks like almost everyone's actually already done so. So I'm, I'll close that one. And then Glenn mentioned this at the beginning as well. Here's our poll. This is if you're interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance. If you want to tell us now, if you know for sure that you do, um, we can follow up with you directly. Okay, and it looks like we've gotten a good amount of responses on there as well. So I'll close this poll. We can get to your questions. So we do have a, if you're ready, Glenn, um, we can get started with our Q&A. Absolutely. Yep, okay, so the first question is, how do other water systems monitor and enforce usage restrictions? Oh, this is a great question. So um, how do we figure out if people are actually following this? And, um, you know, I, it's, it's a hard thing to do, you know, because you, you as a water system almost have to be now in the business of policing usage. So there's a couple of things that, um, that we've seen. One is that uh, some of some meter technology, some newer meter technology allows us to actually see water usage in a more real-time basis. And so that could be one way to do it. And in fact, um, we didn't have a slide example of this, but there are some places now that have a separate meter for outdoor water use that can actually be shut off and turned back on at various times of day. But if you don't have that kind of 
uh, metering system, which I, I realize not all water systems will because it's relatively new technology. Um, you know, some water systems set up phone numbers where you can basically uh, call in and rat on your neighbors. And um, some of you may not like that idea terribly much, but that is often the way that things work is that there'll be a line that people can call to uh, to complain about their neighbors using water or maybe, you know, your water folks are out driving and they'll notice that, you know, there seems to be runoff from somebody's driveway or or uh, lawn during the day or if they're out doing their rounds during the day of repairing water lines, they'll see watering that's going on otherwise. But it's a tricky question because, you know, you're having to kind of take a, a peek at what your customers are doing and in some ways trusting them. But as I said, technology can help a little bit because in some cases those um, those things can actually be shut off. Now, my mother lives in a community where they have a day of the week and time of use restrictions. And uh, they had a power outage that reset her sprinkler system. And, you know, she's elderly and not terribly tech savvy. And her sprinkler came on at the wrong time because the clock had been reset. She didn't know how to fix it. And she actually got fined over it because it was reported or somebody noticed it and uh, or maybe they were able to tell through the meter. So, you know, in that particular case, she kind of called them up and had to plead and, and explain the situation. And I think they were willing to forego the fine. So again, just realize if you are enforcing the mandates, you may get into situations where, you know, something like that happens and you'll have to decide how you want to handle that, that particular situation. Um, another thing I just want to mention real quick uh, in terms of the new metering technology is um, we're now getting to the point with some meters where people will be able to get uh, an app for their smartphone or go on their computer and be able to monitor their own water use in real time. And it's something that is increasingly becoming popular for electric utilities and some water systems are starting to do it as well. And that's just another way of increasing customer information. And I think over, you know, the next 10 or 20 years as meters get replaced and that type of technology becomes more standard or even more expected, that will be another way to help customers understand their water use and another way for systems to kind of monitor when water is being used. Great. Um, so there's just under two minutes left, so we can just do one more question. In your experience, do these types of non-pricing approaches work better than pricing approaches? So it depends, I guess, on how you define better. <laughs> um, I think they are effective at um, getting people to not use water and maybe as effective or in some cases, depending on the type of program, more effective than a pricing approach. But as I said, you're going to potentially run into some revenue issues. And so I think, you know, it's interesting the way we've set this up. We did the overview and now we're doing this deep dive. And we want to put this information out there because I think from a conservation management perspective, these are all really important types of programs. But um, and we've seen them succeed. All of these types of programs are ones we have seen be successful in different parts of the country. But I do think that success here, you know, it depends on whether you're measuring it strictly based on gallons have been reduced or if it's based on gallons are reduced but revenue was okay. Awesome. All right. Well, do you, at this point, it's 2.59. We're right on the limit of our one-hour webinar. Um, if there's any other questions at this point, what you can do is, or if we didn't get to your question for some reason, you can always send them to Glenn um, or to me. That's systems at syr.edu. Um, and Glenn, do you have any other closing comments? Uh, just to say my contact information is up on the screen. I would love to chat with any of you if you are um, facing some conservation needs and to talk about the different strategies that, that may or may not work uh, best for your water system. And again, uh, thank you for answering the polls about your current practices. And I may, uh, we're always looking for more examples of successful programs and frankly, looking for examples of not successful approaches. So. Um, you may be getting a follow-up email from me in the next week or so uh, based on those poll responses. So thank you in advance for, um, for taking some time to chat with me about your system. And again, just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. Really appreciate your time. And 
you know, visit efcnetwork.org for all of our webinars. We'll have many more coming up over the next couple of weeks. So we hope to see you again on a future webinar or workshop. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'm uh, ending the webinar now. Farewell. <laughs>